Uh, hey guys, I am back. Yeah. Well, so after this one, I am posting the third and final episode of uh, Mental Illness Deku. So, hopefully, you guys will enjoy this series. This is the series after. This is the special series. So, I had this idea after the Crunchy Fat made the first episode, and this was before the the Ra uh, Ravenclaw made the, his uh, episode zero. So, I've taken this off of the Crunchy Fat. Great dude, go watch him. Um, how should I say this? I did not like how he did it. So yeah. We start our story off with a 10 year old child. She's had a great life with a, in a quirkless family. Well, she's mainly been quirkless, except for one of her parents has a lineage of dragon quirks. And her father doesn't know, but her father actually has an ability. If you guys want the details on what an ability is, besides a quirk, go to Shiro Senpai, the YouTuber, and watch the collab between me and her. I will link, I'll put a link to the collab. Hopefully, I'll put a link to the collab in the description. If I don't, oh well. So, that's, I'm using those as the percentages for this what if. So we go to, um, she just got home from it raining and everybody's been giving her weird looks ever since it started raining because it's exactly 12 days from her birthday it is october 5th and it's 12 days from her birthday and her ability finally activated so her skin is now bleach white and she hasn't seen she hasn't looked at herself she's just walked home in the rain because her mother's has a very bad job her father is working five or five jobs a week trying to support them. So her mother hasn't been the nicest. And her father is loving. And this is going to be the wor one of the worst days of her life in a series of few days. Because she, when she gets home, she finds her mother crying. And her mother won't say what's wrong. Whatsoever. So she decides to go take, up, take a shower. She goes upstairs and takes a shower. While she's cleaning herself, she finally notices that her skin's now bleach white. So she gets out of the shower. She pats herself dry. The air is still a little moist. Uh, don't like that word. The air is still a little moist. So her skin's still bleach white and she doesn't know why. She walks out of her bathroom and walks into her room where the air is completely dry. Oh, a, li a little damp from the rain outside, but pretty much dry. And a few minutes later, she looks down at her hands, and her hands are normal colored again. And she goes, okay, whenever I get water on me, I turn different colors. I may be a quirk that I just didn't, that the doctor didn't know about. We go to her birth date. 
Her parents know that she loves swimming. Her mother just doesn't care. Her father booked her a complete day at a indoor swimming pool. Her, for her, her father, and her mother. But the day that she found out that she may have a quirk that's activated by water, her father went missing. So her mother decided to take her because she wanted to do one last thing before she dumped the girl on the street. And maybe her father is actually at the pool waiting and wanted to surprise her with something special. So he's been working extra hard and not being able to come home from all the work he's doing. Now, I'm just saying now, overhaul killed him. Just by the way. Ari also is going to have an ability. Her ability is the time, uh, is just called time. And if anybody has read the advanced player in the tutorial tower knows the demon girl with the ten steps, that's what Ari looks like. She has two horns, bleach white hair, black cannon, cat-like eyes, and sharp teeth. That's what Ari looks like. So, her mother has brought her to the pool. She gets into her swimming suit, her swimsuit, and she jumps into the pool and immediately, on contact with, on complete submersion in the water, transforms into a Hydra. She transforms into a small version of what you see here. It's just big enough to, no to really notice it in the pool. Depending on how big the container is, depends on and how big the hydra she forms into becomes. And she gets out of the she gets her head up out of the water, and she's now looking at her mother five times. And her mother screams bloody murder and calls the police. Her daughter is taken away for experimentation, but this police uh these police officers are completely corrupted. No matter what happens, they just follow the orders of Overhaul. Overhaul hears about her, orders them to take her to a facility. He does tests for a whole year. And he finds out that she's the daughter of one of the men he killed. One of the random workers he had that he killed. So he's like, ooh. <laughs> I'm going to tell her when she turns 18. We skip five years. Ari finally activated her ability. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, she's just going to have a mutation quirk with strength and speed. And she's going to look like a villain. Ares gotten used to the title monster, demon, villain, abomination. She's gotten used to all these different labels. Hi, Leo. You can go around the motorcycle. I'm currently recording near my father's motorcycle. Yeah, hi. I'm gonna put you down. I gotta continue recording boobs. So, Eri has gotten close to Izumi. And yes, her name is Izumi. She's gotten close to Izumi because Izumi has also been called Monster, Abomination, Filthy, Disgusting Monster. No good monster. She's been called everything Ari's been called. Anything you can think of about for a, the name of a monster, that's what they've been called. Ari and her have gotten really close. 
no, this is not the shit. <laughs> so after maybe a day or two, it's finally Izumi's birthday. This is her 15th birthday. Eri has her ability. So Eri has been using it to manipulate objects. And she's learned that she can steal time from things. So if you take a firearm, she can steal time from it, make it rust, degrade, and fall apart. If you take a potted plant, she can steal time from it, which makes it grow super quickly, but then immediately die. So, yeah. She could steal time from living and non-living objects. She could steal time from anything. And the more time she takes, the longer she'll be able to live, by the way. But it's more like a process of a thousand to one. A thousand years she takes from things, she gains a year of life. So, yeah takes a lot of energy for her to gain immortality. But she has the ability to do that. Izumi, on the other hand, can only be killed if she is obliterated with objects. Now, let me rephrase that. Izumi can only die if her middle head, her main head, is obliterated into atoms. So she can only die if a nuclear or atomic bomb has been dropped on her center head. Or just her entirely, because that would obliterate her completely. When she's in human form, she's immortal. When she's in hydra form, she's immortal. Unless she's obliterated with a big bomb. Like a really big bomb. So, yeah. I'll be right back. So, today is very special. I'm back, by the way. The chain is being pulled. The machine is turned on. Izumi is being awakened. Overhaul is currently sitting in a boat <clears throat> roughly 10 miles offshore and waiting for Izumi to wake up. Izumi gets up. Eri is sitting next to Overhaul because he doesn't want her to leave his side. And he has technology which keeps them from attacking him or their head's gonna go boom Eri, it'll kill her Izumi, it won't do anything to her and <laughs> Izumi, she brings her head up onto the, one of her heads onto the, the deck and transforms into normal Izumi. Because her ability is forced transformation when she first gets into water. But she has control over her transformations after that. No matter where it is, she's forced to transform when she first submerges herself in water. But then she has complete control over that. And so she's looking at Overhaul now, and he has to have a mask on. All of them have to have masks on around Izumi. <clears throat> and he brings out this small mask. And he br brought out what looks like an Oni mask, and that's the exact mask that you see at the bottom. Yes, it has gold on it. It's, it's goldish blue. 
it's blue and gold. But it can change color depending on her main outfit. The gold obviously obviously can't change color. But Izumi has was given a mask. And he says, you must wear that at all times. And she has to obey. Otherwise, her arms and her legs are going to get blown off. And he's just going to make her sit there without arms and legs. Just bleeding out constantly. Because by this time, she knows all about her abilities. Aerie knows all about her abilities. And she's been tortured. But, like in Tokyo Ghoul, he's given them the task of counting down from 1,000 by 7s, which keeps their sanity. So they can't go cuckoo and just completely ignore pain anymore. They must... Remember the pain and stay sane. So. Hi, Jack. Come here. It's turned off. You don't have to worry about it. Jackie, come here. Come here, Jackie. Come here, come here. And he's running away again. Great, Jack. You're just great. Well, <sighs> it's been lonely for them, but every time that Aerie has has time off, she goes to to basically talk with Izumi and only Aerie and Overhaul have the authority Aerie's legitimately a slave to Overhaul right the second have the authority to wake up Izumi if anybody else tries they either die trying or Izumi eats them So, Overhaul tells her happy birthday and then walks up to her and kicks her back into the water. And says, we're leaving. Go. And Aerie goes back to her spot in the main cabin where Overhaul can keep an eye on her. We skip another three years. Izumi has woken up and Overhaul hasn't come to see her in three years. And she thinks, oh, he doesn't need me anymore. It's my time. She's been plotting an a escape for a while now. So she raises her head and her heads jerk back down. Because of the chains linked on every single one of her necks. It's like a magnetic chain. It's like a magnetic chain. Whenever she gets back down there in Hydra mode, the chains immediately lock to her neck. So, she start. she opens two of her mouths, one just starts releasing globs of magma, and an, magma or lava, and another one starts to freeze the water. Another one starts to show off a disco ball in its own mouth. Another one makes it look like an oil spill. And then another one is making all electronic boats 
all electronic based boats like speed boats, tug boats, cargo ships, all shut down from a power surge. So she's 18 and she's been missing for eight years. So no one thinks this is the little kid that's missing. They just think it's something like some person's quirk. Or a quirked animal. So they get a small team together for just recon. And... They get an electric quirk that can absorb all the electricity there. It starts absorbing the electricity she's shooting. They get a quirk that uh, is used to heat. Another quirk that's used to cold. And so on. Until that there's nobody left. Or no element left. Except for the disco ball. And... Sorry about the noise. I'm fidgeting with a rock. And uh, the black sludge that they don't, they can't identify. It just makes them move very slowly or stop moving entirely. Depending on how close they get and what time of day. They really don't notice that there's shadows over the black sludge, depending on how much of their shadows over the black sludge depends on if they can move or not so yeah um so so the team gets down there and they see this five-headed serpent-like thing with two arms chained to the sea floor so they get back up and they immediately run to Nezu saying, there's a monster at the sea floor. And he goes, what? And he goes, yeah. Um, there's a monster at the sea floor. We need help. So he gets water heroes or uh, ocean heroes, like the seal hero from Froppy's internship. Uh, the water hero from uh, what's his face's internship, uh, Ida, to help move the water or the black sludge away because it's still inside water, so he can still manipulate it slightly. And they have heroes control their elements or part of their elements to help with the fight. And finally, the seal hero gets down there and a few other uh, aquatic heroes get down there and they're about to start the fight and she just shuts off all of them. And she just stares at all of them. And then she starts thrashing against the chains. And they notice that she's not trying to harm them. She's trying to get out. So they're like, okay, let's go up to the surface real quick. Let's deliberate on this. And see if we should let her out. Or it out. And they get back to the surface and they go, okay. She noticed us immediately once we got there. And she started thrashing against the chains. Not attacking us. Not aiming those things at us, because she could have just aimed the lightning at us and immediately fry us. She immediately started thrashing against the change. chains. I think we should unlock it. And this is currently on a call with Nezu. And Nezu says, okay, unlock it then. So they get back down there, and they start pounding the chains. They get one free. A head starts helping them at the chains. 
They get another three. And another. And another. And finally, it's the middle head. And Izumi just stops thrashing. And they notice that he's, the creature has never thrashed its middle head. And it's now looking desperate. For more help. It looks like a wounded puppy. With how it looks. That's how desperate it looks. And they feel vibrations in the water, some of them, because they're aquatic heroes, so they can feel disturbances in the water. And the comm system that they have reaches far enough down so they can talk to each other. They get a notification that a army is heading towards them. So, All my and the other heroes that were that are land based get ready for a fight. And they start seeing different people with bird masks on. Yakuza. And they go, okay, yeah, we know what's going on now. So they start fighting, they start taking them into custody. After maybe an hour, the she finally just gives up. She doesn't know what to do because she's starting to get zapped from the collar. Well, actually not zapped. Punctured in the neck from the collar. And one of the heroes, a shark hero, starts to smell blood. And he taps the seal hero and signals that they need to get her out or it out now, or it will die. And all of a sudden, one of the heroes that's underwater sees a timer show up, and it says three minutes. So he signals them all to look at the timer and then start beating the chain again. She's... Uh, Izumi's now paralyzed because it's starting to stab into her spine, which doesn't allow her to use the hive mind or the nervous system from anything else because her spine's her only way to her main brain. They see that the monster is now completely paralyzed and not moving at all. And they see that the glow in the eyes has dimmed. Like it's sad. So they start beating the chain faster. They cut through half of it. They have a half to go. They have two minutes left. So they start hitting it harder and faster. Finally, the chain snaps free. The spike that was being powered by the chain shoots back into the um, um, collar shattering the collar she swims away and takes the heroes with her the bomb goes off and she swims back puts the heroes on the surface of the water and then dives underneath the water 10 days later the heroes get called that there's a giant pearlescent ball with scales on the shore the pretty much all the heroes arrive on shore to see what it is and the seal hero arrives because he's close by and he wanted to see what the fuss was all about on the hero chatter and he sees an eye poking out so he waves at the eye because he feels like he knows this thing already. And a head pops out. And it starts to shrink. The creature. When, by the way, she can keep her form outside of water. She just has to really concentrate on it. That's what one of her five brains can do. Yes, she has five brains. 
she it starts to shrink slowly transforming into the woman you see at the bottom and she has no clothes on whatsoever she just has a mask on and this is a steel mask stainless steel that is super reinforced to perfectly adapt to whatever element she starts to breathe And she waves at the seal hero when she's finally fully trained back into human. And all the heroes are like, wait, wait, wait. Uh, so the seal hero calls up Nezu saying, we need you down here now. Izumi, remembering how to write, takes a rock and starts to draw in the sand uh, symbols or kanji. Because... I'm not going to say that she draws in English. No, she knows Japanese. This is Japan. Because the entire U.S. N Navy and Marine Force would be descending on top of her if she was found in America. Just by the way. Uh, <laughs> so she writes, thank you, and points at the seal hero. The seal hero who just says you're welcome it's what heroes do can we get your name so she writes her name and everybody looks at her and she writes i haven't talked in three years and they go what and then she grabs the mask because one of them was about to take the mask from her and she just lets it down a little, and they see these sm the smoke, the heat, every kind of thing that she he could possibly be breathing just start coming out of her mouth. So she puts the mask back on and shakes her head no. And they, and all the heroes understand, yeah, we we don't need to take we can't take the mask that's the only thing keeping them alive if they're near her she's taken to the police station she's given a pat uh and suguchi naomasa walks in and he starts talking to her and she understands what he's saying because it takes like three brains to understand human speech after not hearing a human voice in three years. But it's starting to get easier. Because she's been doing it for a long time now. Almost the entire day. And she asks for food. Mainly meat. Of the fish variety. And she just says, food, fish. And she's lost... 90% of her, the ability to speak. And she couldn't walk. Because she hasn't used her legs in a really long time. Fuck. God. So... They called up a certain hero and asked for them to borrow the hero's daughter. So they called up the dragon hero and asked to borrow the borrow his daughter because they know that she can lift more than he can. Rukyu arrives on the scene and is asked to carry Izumi to the police station. So she reluctantly does it, and when Rukyu gets close, Izumi starts backing up. So she starts saying comforting words like, I'm not here to hurt you, uh, and things like that. And slowly Izumi allows Rukyu to get closer, and Rukyu touches her Izumi, and Izumi uses her full arm strength and back pedals like 30 40 yards in a single uh, stroke of her arms and she starts shaking from physical contact 
it takes another like three hours for her to calm down. So Ruku put on gloves and after the three hours, she figured, oh, no hand touching unless gloves are on. So we go to uh, the interrogation room again. It's an, it's an interrogation room because they have no place else to put her with the accommodations that she requires. Like a bed. They can only fit a bed in the interrogation room. It's obviously a cot, not an actual bed. So she can sleep somewhere instead of on the floor of a jail cell. Or just an office room. Even though that would probably be a lot more comfy a lot more comfy than a cot. But anyway <laughs> we go to This is the next day. She's laying on the cot and she starts opening her mouth behind the mask, obviously, so they can't see this. And they hear vocalization. And now Moss's alarm goes off on his phone saying there is audio. So he starts listening and it just says, and she's just trying to say the same word over and over and over. Overhaul. After an hour of listening and just watching her lay on the cot, trying to say this one word, he starts putting it together. She's trying to say overhaul. So he chimes in via his phone and uh, remote connection, connecting to one of the speakers. He says, are you trying to say overhaul? And she flips out. Because she doesn't know where he's, come, where he's calling from. And he goes, don't worry. I'm currently off locate. I'm out. Of, I'm currently in a different location. And the room picked up audio, so I was alerted. This, you're not in trouble. But are you trying to say overhaul? And she just quickly shakes her head yes and hides underneath the small blanket that she was provided. Because she's frightened that he just came out of nowhere, his voice. Remember, she still has somewhat of a mental uh, capacity of a child because she wasn't taught any better. So, Namasa, who was at home, packed his stuff up, and immediately drove to the police station, maybe five o'clock in the morning. He walks into the building. Everybody's like, Nawasa, why are you here? It's not your shift yet. And he goes, she vocalized the word. And they all look at him and go, what? Because everybody at the police station knows now, if a door, a specific interrogation room door, you hear a knock at it, you open it. You must have gloves on, and you must not be wearing a mask. He says, bring me up a, a picture of the most wanted a crime boss. They bring up all for one. And he goes, not that one. They go, oh, overhaul? And he goes, yes. And he takes the picture, and he goes, I'll be back. This man back. Just know... Depending on her reaction, depends on, and if we have stuff to charge over hallway. So, he walks into the room, he has gloves on, and he has no mask on whatsoever. He can't have a mask on, or her, her PTSD just flares up, and she thinks of overhaul. He walks, he sits down at the table, and he's brought egg with fish. Because she requested fish be in every single one of her meals, because she's so used to it. No seasoning whatsoever. And once she learned, 
she, once she was retaught the difference between cooked and raw, she asked for raw, and they said, no, we will only give you cooked, but we will still give you fish. So now she has fish. Cooked fish, but it's still fish. So after maybe 10, 20 more or minutes of her eating the eggs with fish, she's gotten used to cooked food within the last two days. And Nezu has come by to the police station, not to her yet. And he asked to have a meeting with her in a week. So he was told, you can have a meeting with her in a week. We're going to skip a week in a sec. But uh, now Masa says, are you willing to confirm an identity for us of overhaul? And she gives him like a what look and he goes, just shake your head yes or no if this is overhaul. And he puts a picture of overhaul down. And she just vigorously shakes her head yes. And was about to take her mask off to burn the picture with one of her breasts. And he immediately took the picture and ripped it up. Seeing her violent reaction towards it. And he goes, okay. Uh, I, 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 see what, I see what you mean by... I see what you're trying to do. Uh, well, he can't get you here. I, I will make sure of that. I will make sure that no one under overhaul will get you here. And she, she vocalized something else. And all she said was air. And then she shut up, walked to her cot, laid down, turned away from the door, and immediately passed out. We skip a week. Nezu has walked into the building and he asks, can I see her? And Namasa shakes his head, no. And he, uh, Nezu says, what do you mean? And he goes, well, we, we've been keeping an eye on her and treating her well. She has not moved for five days. And we know she's still alive because she allows us to take medical examinations while she's laying there. She still has a pulse. She's still breathing. And her nutrients are completely full, which is weird because she hasn't eaten in five and a half days. Nezu walks over to the door and says, can I walk in? And he goes, yeah, you're a rodent. And he goes, I'm not a rodent. I'm a chimera. <sighs> Dang humans. So he walks in and Izumi, smelling a different scent, not Namasa, flips her head towards it and starts growling. Like dragon deep growling. And he goes, don't worry, don't worry. I am not someone bad and i'm also walks in with full gear on saying he's not bad but he's a damn rodent who wants to talk with you and then i'm also walks out and he goes don't be too long nezu nezu looks at her and goes i would like you to join my school and her remembering what school is because she's been thinking about her past the last five days just shakes her head, yeah. And she softly says, Can I be alone? He goes, Is that a yes to you wanting to be alone? Or is that a yes to joining my school? And she very, very, very softly says, To joining your school. He goes, Okay. I'll leave you alone now. And he leaves, and now Moss is like, is that seriously all you wanted to ask her? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, you are such 
an idiot. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, the last five days, she's been mumbling to herself, but not interacting with anybody that goes in there. You are the very first person, besides the people here, and the only people I trust here, who's had verbal conversations with her besides just fish, yes and no. So you are literally the only one who's ever heard her, besides me, vocalize something different than fish, yes and no. And he goes, hmm. well, she's going to start talking a lot more at my school. And I'm also goes, oh, God. So we skip another week. And Namasa walks in saying, I looked for the person you want, you told me about with just a name, and we found her. And she flips around and looks at him, and just her eyes are starry and watering. And he goes, she is the number two most wanted villain in all of Japan. And he goes, the only reason why she's number two is because of her body count. Otherwise, she hasn't really done anything villainous. She's only killed villains. So I don't really see her as villain. I see her as an anti-hero. Which is a hero and not a hero at the same time. But, eh. Who cares? So... And Izumi's just looking at him, and she just goes, where? And he goes, well, don't know where she is. Last time and we saw her, the entirety of Japan, was, I don't know any sectors of Japan, so I'm just going to label them like uh, Tokyo Ghoul. Sector 20. So yeah, I'm labeling them like Tokyo Ghoul for now. If you guys know any uh, cities in Japan, then you guys can put it down in the comments. And a way to say it, because I can't can't read J uh, Japanese. Or know any cities in, or the city that uh, Izuku first met Aryu in. So, we skip... A few months, and this girl has constantly been thinking about the woman that she had to carry to the police station. And she doesn't know why, but she can't get this woman out of her head. So she goes to UA and asks, for the entrance exam. Again. And Nezu goes, sure, but you don't need it. And she goes, I know. I just want to take it again. Clears my head. And he goes, okay. You took it when you are 10 years old. When you first awakened your quirk. And she goes, I don't have a quirk. I'm quirkless. And he goes, then what is the power you're showing? You have a quirk. And she goes, I do not have a quirk. And yes, I'm not making her, her quirked. I'm making everybody else in the story quirked. But not her, Izumi, or Eri. So yeah. I'm going to end it here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you guys did, click that like button. And if you guys like my content... Please consider subscribing. Uh, part two is going to be out at, uh, the week after next. So this is coming out this week. Next week is going to be illness. And if I remember correctly, I'm going to have experimented on Naruko this week, next week, and the week after. So the end of illness is next week. So yeah, hopefully you guys are looking forward to that one. So this is a special 
Deku, what if? Yay. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Talk to you guys later. <laughs> Bye.